We are continuing to follow breaking news. We first told you about at 5 o'clock today. Right now, several fire departments battling a grass fire in far southeast Bear County. This is a live look from Sky 12. Yeah, that fire first broke out around 4 in the 12,000 block of Dunop Road. It's burned at least four acres so far. We're told San Antonio Fire, Bear County Fire, Wilson County Fire are responding. Bear County Fire also tells us some buildings are in flames and several others are being threatened. Of course, so dry out there. That is a huge concern right now. Donop Road is closed between Highway 181 and Old Corpus Christi Road. Officials asking people to avoid this area until further notice. We're going to keep an eye on this and keep you updated. To other news at six, shop owners at Market Square say they're upset and feel violated after a string of break-ins a few days ago. At least four shops broken into and thousands of dollars of merchandise gone. RJ Marquez visited with two store owners who explained what happened and their hope that those responsible are caught. I feel very disrespected. This is how we feed our family. This is how we pay our bills. Alexis Perez, the co-owner of Leather Creations, says thieves smashed her front door early Friday morning and stole nearly $1,200 in merchandise. They took big duffel bags. They took a few of our high-end purses. And I'm assuming what they did is they got the duffel bags and just stuffed everything they could. Thieves also broke into Don Ramon's. The co-owner showed a surveillance video of a group of people walking outside before their side window was smashed. They just saw a handbag and so, and they just stuck their hand and just pulled it out and basically that was it on that part. Greg Benya says his family has owned Don Ramon's for more than 40 years and they've never had a string of break-ins like this. It's like if someone broke into your own home or break into your own car, you feel violated. Next door to Benya's shop is Jesse's Jewelry and Imports. The owner, Daniel Ramirez, shared this surveillance video and photos of at least two people inside his store. But Ramirez told us thousands of dollars in jewelry was stolen on Friday morning. These owners are now afraid this will happen again and are asking for more security or police presence in the area. When you've been here so many years and not having this issue really just touched uh, the families and then other store owners. I'm angry, I'm upset. You can't just come and, you know, take what you want. If you have the will to steal, you should have the will to work for the things that you want. You can't just take it from people. Back out here live at Market Square, and we're outside Leather Creation where you could see this door is still boarded up as this shop deals with this leap, with this recent break-in. Now, we checked with San Antonio police, and they tell us that this is an active investigation at this time, but there are no known suspects. We also asked if they would increase patrol, something that these shop owners want in this area, and the response we got is that the bike patrol unit and safe units are always out here at Market Square patrolling for active crime. If you have any more information on this, please feel free to call S. SAPD reporting live from Market Square. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, RJ. Happening right now, the Uvalde CISD School Board holding a meeting following Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell's retirement announcement on Friday. The entire UCISD Police Department has also been suspended. As Lee Waldman reports, tonight's board meeting is expected to get contentious. The town of Uvalde is divided following the retirement announcement from Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell, many voicing their support of him, while families of the raw victims say they wish they received the same support in the months following the shooting. Many of those families this weekend telling us they can feel the tension and it's causing even more pain. They're also making it clear they never asked for Harold to retire. Instead, they asked for him to stand with them and to suspend the district police pending an investigation. Kimberly Rubio, mom of Lexi Rubio, who was killed at Rob, says she knows how much Harold has done for the community during his decades in education, but this is about accountability and doing what's right. As far as, you know, how Harold, I know the community is really upset. A lot of people love him, myself included. But it's about leadership right now, and it's about supporting us families. I wish more people in the community understood that. We want justice for our kids. We want to hold those who had a role in this responsible. In a Facebook post by Harold's wife attributed to him, he writes, quote, I will remain here throughout the year until a new superintendent can be named, unquote. The school board will have the opportunity to take action following the closed door session tonight on the night beat. We'll bring you the full wrap up of tonight's school board meeting in Uvalde. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, San Antonio police investigating a shooting that left a woman in critical condition. Officers were called to a crash around 3.30 this morning near the intersection of Fredericksburg Road and Gardena Streets. That's on the city's northwest side. Crews arrived to find the woman suffering from a gunshot wound to her head. Investigators say that woman was on the phone at the time of the crash and the shooting. 
She was taken to University Hospital where she's in critical condition. This is an ongoing investigation. And tonight we know the name of a woman who was hit and killed by a truck on the northeast side. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has identified her as 46 year old Christy Castro. Police say she was walking in the 6500 block of Randolph Boulevard last Monday when she was hit by a truck. That driver did stop to help. Castro was pronounced dead there at the scene and that driver is not expected to face any charges. The trial for a San Antonio mother accused of murdering her four year old daughter began today. Erica Hernandez shares opening statements that give us a glimpse at how this trial is shaping up. Jessica Briones took her daughter, four-year-old Olivia Briones, to SAPD's Prue substation on September 5th, 2017, unresponsive. This body cam footage from that day shown in court to the jury. The child died a day later at University Hospital, and Jessica was charged with her death. Numerous injuries found on Olivia's body were described to the jury. Some of those injuries doctors believe could have been older, way before her death. Doctors notice she's got numerous scars. She's got injuries to her ears and she appears malnourished. The prosecution told jurors that doctors and the medical examiner later determined Olivia had injuries throughout her body and several head injuries. All the other evidence you have will show you that the one person that could have done this, the one person who had sole care and access to Olivia, and the one person with a litany of excuses that doesn't add up is Jessica Briones. Meanwhile, the defense says Jessica is wrongfully accused and that the detective on the case got it wrong. Children that are accident prone, in this case, the mother is also a bit accident prone. She can't explain it, but that doesn't mean that she's guilty of beating this child to death. The defense also says they have their own theory as to what happened and they will reveal that later in the trial. If found guilty, Jessica Briones faces up to life in prison. At the Kedina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A San Antonio man has been sentenced to more than 30 years in prison for the murder of his own mother. 33-year-old Ivan Castro found guilty of killing his mother, Leticia Barnett, in May of 2018. Barnett was stabbed multiple times in the face and the neck. Castro says he attacked his mother because she sexually abused him as a child. But evidence revealed in the trial proved that never happened. Castro was sentenced to 35 years in prison. The search for a witness allegedly connected to luring migrants to a chartered flight from San Antonio to Martha's Vineyard continues. However, as Lulac tells our Alicia Barrera, they fear she could be at risk of running away. It's the name that has been circulating among migrants, advocacy groups, and authorities since last month. When I was at Martha's Vineyard interviewing the refugees, all I had was a name, Perla. Domingo Garcia is the national president of LULAC and is determined to help track down the woman his team has identified as Perla Huerta. She is originally a graduate from San Antonio High School and a veteran of the military. And then we actually had one of the refugees give us a picture of her when they got on the plane to Martha's Vineyard. It was at the San Antonio airport when they took off. She gave them water. Garcia adds that most of the migrants he spoke to were from Venezuela and were processed by Border Patrol down in Eagle Pass before finally arriving here to San Antonio's Migrant Center. Migrants tell Garcia they were offered work, money, and other incentives in exchange for a signature on a form stating they voluntarily wanted to go to a different location. We filed a complaint with the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. because we believe several federal immigration and human trafficking laws might have been broken by this plot. Garcia says they've all also passed along all information to the Bear County Sheriff's Office for its criminal investigation. Although BCSO says they have not confirmed or identified any person of interest involved, quote, any and all evidence that has been submitted to us regarding this investigation is being reviewed by handling investigators, end quote. Garcia's hope is that Perla and others involved are identified by authorities and found as soon as possible. It was a covert operation uh, and they knew that they had to do it in the shadows and we're worried that she might try to leave the country. Now they continue efforts to make migrants aware of the dangers and free offerings from strangers. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. For months now, there has been a battle brewing over Brackenridge Park. If nothing's done, the tree is always going to win. I really thought that was something that would never come to fruition. It is a debate that literally has deep roots. The city wants to preserve several historic structures in Brackenridge Park, north of downtown. 
Some of those structures led to the creation of San Antonio. But that preservation is pitted against protecting nature. The city plans to cut down or relocate nearly 80 trees in this park. And at KSAT Explains, we show you what's in this plan and what's at stake. KSAT Explains is coming up at 6.30. Don't forget tomorrow, the last day to register to vote. And right now on KSAT.com, we have a complete guide for the 2022 elections. The guide includes all the races and candidates for each election in our area. It also includes propositions that are going to be on the ballot, how to register to vote, and other important election information. Just scan the QR code on your screen to find this article. And check out traffic on this Monday, too. I haven't seen a lot of traffic problems out there. This is 281 in San Pedro. I think that probably <laughs> points to the fact that traffic is very light on this holiday Monday. Yeah, these last couple of times we've taken this camera traffic luckily hasn't been an issue, but I've been paying attention to the brown spots in the grass because those are getting larger. Oh my goodness. Yes, they are. We are in so much need of rain. A nice view though there at a live cam with those puffy cumulus clouds. I just wish they could grow a little bit taller and produce some rain for us. Hey, speaking of lack of rainfall, the aquifer is down another half foot over the past 24 hours, 30 feet below the monthly average uh, for October. And this says it too. This is a look at precipitation deficit over the last 365 days. Most of us around the San Antonio metro area should have about two feet more of rain. Yeah, very dry. And when you look at how much rain San Antonio has seen this year, I'm going to be comparing it to some cities in Texas that may surprise you that have seen more rain than us. All of that and, of course, your forecast coming up. My voice was heard. Let me keep making it heard and let me try to get other voices heard as well. Still to come here on the News at 6, helping the homeless. How a man in his 20s is on his way to starting a nonprofit to help young people experiencing homeless details after the break. They're not a statistic, they're a person, they're a huge part of their life that's now gone. Five suicides in a single year, the growing concerns for active and retired San Antonio police and what peer support groups say they are missing from leadership. And new video shows part of a deadly shootout in a Bear County neighborhood, the scary situation some homeowners say they faced and why investigators say the victim was caught in the crossfire. Those stories and more on the night beat at 10. Well, he may be only 26 years old, but he's changing the, the entire landscape of resources for San Antonio youth experiencing homelessness. And his work is not going unnoticed. As Courtney Freeman explains, he just accepted a prestigious state award and is using the momentum to create his own nonprofit. How you been, Elmo? Pretty good. Yeah? Thank y'all for what y'all do for us. Oh, you're welcome. Cameron Reese works at Cortisone, helping people experiencing homelessness. Yeah, we can definitely do that for you. Yeah, I, I really do appreciate that, sir. Uh, yeah, no problem. If it seems like he's in his element, it's because he is. Back in 2018, I became homeless through somebody else's drug use that made it unsafe for me to stay in the place that I was at. He landed at the Thrive Youth Center at Haven for Hope, where he met friends who helped him start the Youth Act board, a group of young people working to close gaps in services for unsheltered youth. I was like, you know what? My voice was heard. Let me keep making it heard and let me try to get other voices heard as well. That youth action board helped secure almost seven million dollars in HUD funding to open a youth drop in center right here in downtown San Antonio at Travis Park United Methodist Church. You can take a nap, something to eat, take a shower, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And that's what is really needed. And the state took notice. On September 29th, Reese accepted an award from the Texas Homeless Network for his outstanding work. But he's only just begun. I want to start my own nonprofit that addresses those gaps in resources. And I want it to be as low barrier as possible. So it's going to be basically all encompassing of a drop in center. A shelter, extended age programs, grant writing, everything needed to support youth currently falling through the cracks. It's just really hard to get out of if you're not taught the proper way to be an adult. With that help, he knows his peers will succeed just like he has. Courtney Friedman. KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Elmo. All right, so we have talked about how we know we need some rain, and we're just still waiting. 
Sarah. Oh, we are. And, and you know, there is some hope, especially for early next week. So, of course, we'll talk about that. I wanted to start, though, just by putting in perspective how dry it is outside. By this time, you probably know that this is the driest year to date in San Antonio's recorded history. Records go back all the way to 1886. We've seen just a little bit over eight inches of rain so far this year. We should have 17 and a half more inches of rain this year than we do out there right now. And some places that have seen more rain than San Antonio may surprise you. Del Rio, Texas. Del Rio, you have seen almost 13 inches of rain this year. This is the first time, this is a, about the 10th time since records have been kept that Del Rio at this time of year is ahead of San Antonio in the rainfall department. So it's pretty rare. El Paso, Texas has seen a eight, little bit more than eight inches of rain and Roswell, New Mexico has seen more than eight inches of rainfall uh, and more than us here in San Antonio. So these areas are typically pretty dry and it just goes to show we really need rain here in San Antonio. And as we look at the weather setup, there could be a couple of showers out near Valverde County later on this evening Evening, but they'll die down with the loss of daytime heating. Really, the rain across Texas right now is from Wichita Falls all the way down to San Angelo and actually Fort Stockton dealing with some severe thunderstorms at the moment. This is from a trough of low pressure that unfortunately is going to move north and away from south central Texas. But let me take you through the future cast here, show you that early tomorrow morning we may have some clouds, but tomorrow's going to be a pretty pleasant day. 88 degrees, relatively low humidity a lot like today. Then by Wednesday, notice early in the morning we see clouds return. Wednesday is actually going to be noticeably humid and a front will be moving through Texas, but that front is going to fizzle out really in a big way before it makes it to us temperature wise. Wednesday in the afternoon, we're going to be at 92 degrees and toasty, muggy and toasty. So we may even have a bit of a heat index value on Wednesday. This front, as it moves through San Antonio Wednesday night, look at how little rain may come with this front. We're really only looking at about a 20% chance for an isolated shower or storm Wednesday night into Thursday morning. And then behind the front, it's going to be breezy, windy, pardon me, warm and dry. And so we have fire danger on Thursday. The front drops our temperatures by a whole two degrees. Wow, it really is going to be a weak front, but we'll feel the windy and dry conditions behind that front. At least by Friday, we'll still have low humidity and temperatures will be in the upper 80s, so it'll feel great. With that high pressure system moving off to the east, we're gonna bring in some Gulf moisture over the weekend. So by Saturday, that low humidity, is going to be gone. It's going to be muggy again by Saturday, but this may actually work in our favor as far as rain is concerned, because by Monday, when a front approaches, we have better rain chances with that low level moisture in place. So, so far, we've got about a 30% chance for rain on Monday, but we may be able to bump that up if things work in our favor, and I certainly hope they do. Outside right now, it's 84 degrees, gusts up to 21 miles per hour. It's going to be a breezy evening tonight with temperatures falling into the 70s. Tomorrow, we'll be waking up at 65 degrees. Again, a very similar day to today, 88 for the high temperature. And then once again, as we look at the seven-day forecast, warming up into the 90s, but by Thursday, we'll have low humidity and windy conditions again. And then over the weekend, we're hoping that rain works in our favor by Monday. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right. You know, it's not the time of the year where you really care about the wins and the losses, but you do care about the injuries. Yeah, and you care about players' health. In this particular case, Zach Collins, who's been battling back from an ankle injury that forced him to miss two seasons ago. And then now he's battling back from that. But he's set back on what happened last night. When we come back, more about that. And the Roadrunners find a run game to complement their quarterback. Coming up. San Antonio Spurs departed for Salt Lake City today. They left behind Zach Collins. That's because the Spurs forward has entered the NBA's concussion protocol following last night's loss in the New Orleans Pelicans. Collins had been working his way back since missing the entire 2021 season due to an ankle injury, appearing in only 28 games last season before this latest setback. Spurs are still looking for their first preseason victory after falling to the Pelicans last night, 111-97. It was a very competitive game against Zion Williamson and his teammates in the first half with Doug McDermott leading the silver and black with 14 points, but then came the third quarter.
quarter where the Pelicans went on a 25-5 run to open up a 23-point lead. The Spurs did outscore the Pelicans in the fourth quarter, 31-24, but it wasn't enough. Young guys just trying to adjust to the NBA. You know, it's a different game. And, you know, they're, they're willing, you know, real coachable, uh, good athletes, and just take some time for them to understand how we want to play. The Spurs announcing today they have exercised team options on both of the contracts of Devin Vassell and Josh Primo. In Vassell's case, it's his fourth year option for next season. And in Primo's case, it's the third year for 23-24 season. Next up for the Spurs will be that road trip we're talking about to Utah to take on the Jazz tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. The UGSA Roadrunners are coming off a hard-fought victory over Western Kentucky. The same Hilltoppers the Roadrunners beat to win their first ever Conference USA title last year, and now they're 2-0 in conference play. One improvement the Roadrunners have made during this season is the run game in the 31-28 victory over the Hilltoppers. Brendan Brady had 19 carries for 82 yards and one touchdown, and Traylon Smith, 12 carries for 65. What sort of skill sets do the pair of running backs bring to the Roadrunners' offense? They're both mature, they're both older backs, they know what they're supposed to be doing, um, whether that's run game, pass game, protection wise. Um, both of those guys are a very tremendous asset for us. Definitely appreciate those guys. And, uh, you know, both of those guys, you know, are a blessing for us, whether, you know, Brady's in or Trey's in, um, we don't skip a beat. All right, next up for the Roadrunners is a Friday night game at 7 p.m. at Florida International, where UTSA is 33 and a half point favorites. Texas Longhorns are coming off their 49-0 round of Oklahoma Sooners in the Red River rivalry. Not only are the most points scored against OU by Texas in this series, it's also the largest margin of victory. And this game also marked the return of Quinn Hewers, the starting quarterback for the very first time since he injured his throwing shoulder in the narrow loss to Alabama. In his comeback game, Hewers threw for 289 yards and four touchdowns. He's just a natural passer, you know, so I, I know that sounds like what, what is he just a broad scope of like every yeah, of course a quarterback's a natural passer, but I think that when he throws the ball things the feel of the pass come naturally to him. It, it doesn't feel like it's a game plan thing or it's robotic like he did something in training with his quarterback coach. He's just dropping back, feeling the coverage, feeling our route, and he's throwing the ball and he throws people open. Um, and so that, that's the first part. I think the second part with Quinn that is relatively unique for a guy that's only played about nine quarters, he's very calm. Um, you know, I don't ever feel like the moment's too big for him. All right, next up, the Longhorns are now back in the top 25 at number 22. We'll host Iowa at Royal Memorial Stadium Saturday morning at 11 a.m. That was something to watch because I did not expect that big of a route. But nonetheless, when you got that Hewers kid in there, he is really talented. And Oklahoma's really struggling. They're, they're having a tough year. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. Up next, KSAT explains the Brackenridge Park plan, what it's all about. Next. Preserving history and protecting nature. It is a balancing act in the plan to revamp Brackenridge Park north of downtown. And part of that plan will cut down or relocate 77 trees. That's the part that's received the most attention and the most public backlash. KSAT explains where that plan stands now and why the city says those trees have to go. We get the pain that this is causing. We, we wish there was another way. You're removing how many trees from a park? We need those trees. If nothing's done, the tree is always going to win. I really thought that was something that would never come to fruition. Some of these structures are a big reason why San Antonio is here in the first place. And that's what the Brackenridge Park Project is all about. Preserving San Antonio history, but protecting its natural resources has become a huge concern. In early 2022, the San Antonio Parks and Recreation Department unveiled its plan to create more usable spaces and restore several structures within the park deemed historic and culturally significant. There were originally arches on both sides of the pump house. Lewis Fisher sits on the board of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy, and he's the author of a new book, 
Brackenridge, San Antonio's acclaimed urban park. This is the, uh, the pump house that was built in 1878 when the acequia system became outdated. Uh, as the railroad came, the city grew. Acequias, which are gravity fed, can't take water uphill, and the city was growing uphill. So they had to have pumps. Then there's the Spanish Dam. We are standing in what is presently one of the most derelict areas of Brackenridge Park. The dam has been buried to protect it, but here's a photo of its excavation several years ago. The dam provided water to San Antonio long before it was San Antonio. The original uh, Spanish Ezequiel Dam that was built in July 1776, believe it or not. Back at the pump house, large arches that were once underneath have been filled in and the river dammed up. But the plan would reopen those. The original arches are still on the other side and that those will, that infill will be coming out and those arches uh, will be uh, restored. So where we're standing, all of this would be completely gone. It would be a channel again. On this side of the pump house, just above those now filled in arches is where a big problem is quite literally rooted, the trees. You can see it's within, that might be four inches of the structure. Now, even if we weren't doing this project, at some point this tree's gotta go, okay? Otherwise, it's going to start to significantly damage the structural integrity of this uh, cultural resource. That's one of the reasons why the city says 77 trees in Brackenridge Park need to be cut down or moved. If you look around us, you can see some river walls that have completely failed and it's been impact due to root structure. It's a tough decision. It's one that we don't take lightly. In many cases, these trees and the cultural resources are competing for the exact same spot. Some trees are also being removed because they're an invasive species or considered unhealthy trees. Others are being relocated. Some of them heritage trees, meaning they're 24 inches in diameter or bigger. In some cases, we're talking about maybe moving it just 10 to 15 feet. There are all these large cypress, none of that's getting removed. Check out this map. The green dots show the trees that will stay, the blue, the ones to be relocated, and the red dots, the trees to be cut down. In the city's original plan, 105 trees were slated for removal, but there was an outcry from people who thought that was outrageous and irresponsible. So after several public meetings, the city trimmed that number down to 77. Jesse Degollado found out that for some, that is still far too many. Stunning photos of migratory birds, the great egret, the cattle egret, and the yellow-crowned night heron that most people don't really notice as seen through the lens of photographer Alicia Garlock. And they do call me the bird lady. For five years now, they're among the birds Garlock has been watching and documenting. She says many migrate yearly from South and Central America along the Gulf Coast to nest in Brackenridge Park, overlooking the San Antonio River. So many, the city had a plan for the overcrowded trees. It said to prevent rookeries from forming. They wanted to cut down most of these trees so birds would nest. She and others organized a grassroots group, Migratory Birds of San Antonio. You mess with one, you mess with all. We want to save Brackenridge Park, not only for the people, but for our wildlife. Joining them, certified arborist Zygmunt Neary, who'd seen the initial plan. I was gravely disappointed. And he says he was concerned with potentially cutting down trees in a floodplain along a river. That's the scary part, is trying to remove something in this area where this is a huge floodplain and this is the headwaters of the river before it reaches downtown. It just seemed very short-sighted and scary. We don't trust our city. We've lost trust in them. Where's the research? Where's the ecological examinations of how removing all these trees and to disturb the birds is going to impact not only our wildlife but us as well because we're all connected. And by losing trees, Garlock believes an urban heat island will grow larger, raising ozone levels even more. Planting new trees is part of the city's plan for Brackenridge. The number is somewhere between 200 and 220 new trees. So if a tree is considered heritage, larger than 24 inches in diameter for most species, um, you have to plant back uh, three inches for every inch removed. So if it was a 24 inch tree removed, you'd have to plant back 72 inches of trees to replace that one 24 inch tree. While the city's plan aims to preserve history, the bird lady and the arborist want to save the tree 
trees here that have a history of their own. We'd like to see this place maintained in all of its glory and all of its beauty that, you know, our generations of our families here in San Antonio have visited again and again. So what comes next? The city is still finalizing its design, which has to be approved at the state and the federal level. And there's also the issue of money. So far, a little over $9 million has been allocated for the project. We knew we were never going to have enough money to fully design and implement and deliver the 2017 bond project. So with the most recently approved bond, uh, there's an additional $2.5 million that will help augment the current bond project, including other funding as well. But there are other costs to balance at the heart of this project and its debate. A cost to nature. Managing the temperature, managing pollution, um, the environmental benefits, the recent studies on mental health in relation to being in green spaces. And a cost to pieces of San Antonio's past. Look, this area of Brackenridge Park is extremely important historically. We want everybody to know it. To find out even more about this plan, scan the QR code you see here. It's where you can find every KSAT Explained story on demand, including this one. We'll be right back. The San Antonio Public Library Foundation has a mission to strengthen the library in service to our community. And there's a big event coming up. Max Massey traveled to the Library Foundation headquarters to tell us how you can join in and help out. Yes, the San Antonio Public Library Foundation does so much to strengthen our community, but take a look. This is amazing. All of the art, all of the colors, all of the fun. Joined here with Amy. So Amy, what is all this for? This is for our sixth annual Katrina Ball. We, um, it's our largest fundraiser every year. The Library Foundation raises money to help the library with extra things that the city budget can't cover, like capital improvements, technology, that sort of thing. This year, the proceeds, a portion of the proceeds from Katrina Ball go to support the LCRC and the Texana collections at the library. Now, for those who don't know, how important is the foundation to not only the current people here in San Antonio, but the future of San Antonio? Well, in addition to supporting the library, we also at the foundation have a couple of our own internal programs, and those are both focused on early literacy and really building a group of young people who are going to drag their parents to the library. And so what we want is to build that group of kiddos here in San Antonio who understand the importance of the library system and, and all that information and free access to information can do for you. There's a lot going on here. Now, how is this helping out the foundation and how can people step up and join the efforts? You can go to our website at saplf.org and through our events tab, you can still buy tickets, access our silent auction where all of these alabrije will be available for auction and help us out that way. Or you can just make a donation. All right, Amy, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions, we're going to have all those answers. Just head to ksat.com. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam. Is that one lone cloud <laughs> yeah. holding on up top there? It seemed like there were a lot just a few minutes ago, and now they're all cleared out. Science. When you lose the daytime heating, you lose some of the clouds. See, it's science. It science, all comes Sarah. back to the science. Yeah. All right. Well, in the forecast, we're going to talk about tomorrow being a ditto day meaning it'll be pretty much the same. And uh, we'll do point whiplash though this week, some humid days, some dry days. And then finally, I am having a little bit of hope for some rain early next week. These details coming up after the break. All right, we're gonna have to wait a while, but we've been waiting. So we've got some rain chances mm -hmm. to hold on to hope for. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it was nice to see the fact when I was looking through the forecast models that early next week we have some hope for some rain. You know, I just I just really hope it pans out for us because it has been so dry. But before we get to early next week and our rain chances, I want to get you prepared for your week this week. And one thing you'll notice is that the humidity is really going to be up and down. First, let's take a look outside with live cam. Beautiful there this evening. Sunset's going to be really nice. It's 84 degrees outside right now. And take a look at those winds. Winds are 
sustained at about 15 miles per hour from the south southeast and gusting up to 21. So it is a bit breezy out there and we've got a good mix of a few puffy cumulus clouds and those high thin cirrus clouds out there. So tonight partly cloudy in San Antonio. Sun's going to set at 709 here uh, and temperatures will fall into the low 70s. Today we got up to 88 degrees and our morning low was 64, just a little bit above average. Tomorrow's going to look very similar to today. In fact, here's how we'll start off early tomorrow morning. In Kerrville, it'll be 62 degrees. Cool in Uvalde in the morning at 64, 64 in Pleasant and 66 in Del Rio, 62 in New Braunfels. If you're going to be taking the kids to school early tomorrow morning, walking the dog, that's when it's going to be nice and comfortable out there. 60 in Bulverde and Bernie. It'll be 62 in Seguin, 64 in Divine and in Floresville, and 64 out in Uvalde. Your KSAT 12 hour forecast looks pretty similar. Almost a copy and paste forecast will be warming into the 70s in the early morning hours and then by around lunch we'll start to get into the 80s in the afternoon tomorrow. Puffy cumulus clouds a lot like today and around 88 for the high temperature again a lot like today. The one thing that will not be the same is that winds are not going to be quite as breezy tomorrow. We'll have south winds at 5 to 10 rather than 10 to 15. All right, let's take a look at the radar for a second because even though it is quiet in San Antonio, you can see off to the west there there are some storms that are trying to push into western Valverde County. A lot of ranch land out there getting a quick splash of water, but as we've lost this daytime heating, a lot of this is going to lose its oomph. And again, we do not anticipate it moving into San Antonio whatsoever. That rain is a part of a larger system that's bringing some rainfall from Wichita Falls to Midland Odessa down to Fort Stockton and even the Big Bend of Texas. It's all because of this trough of low pressure. Now, ideally, this trough would have moved to the east and pushed into south central Texas, bringing us rain. But instead, this guy's going to move up to the north. So off to the west, closer to uh, western California, this is our next hope for rain. Next Monday, the 17th, we've got right now as it stands about a 30% chance. But that's me hedging my bet, OK, because it has been so dry. I just don't want to get everyone's hopes up just yet. But we may be able to increase those rain chances as the forecast models come into more agreement and of course we'll let you know on air online and on the KSAT Weather Authority app. One thing to keep in mind this week is that dew points are going to kind of be all over the place. So tomorrow, pretty pleasant with dew points in the 50s. By Wednesday, our dew points are going to get into the 60s. It's going to be muggy and warm on Wednesday. Then a weak front moves through, bringing us drier air Thursday and Friday before we see increasing humidity over the weekend. That increasing humidity is one of the things that's going to help us out with our rain chances early next week. But I do want you to notice a couple of things here. Late Wednesday into Thursday morning, a brief shot at only isolated rain. We'll be in the 90s on Wednesday and on Thursday. The big difference is by Thursday we'll have low humidity, so it'll be a dry heat on Thursday and windy. Got to start worrying a little bit about fire danger that day, so think ahead. And then again, hoping for rain early next week. Thank you, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. It is Monday, October 10th. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. Police had this area, 3500 block of Fredericksburg Road, shut down since about 345 this morning. That's when they got a call about a car that had crashed. Police say someone shot right through her window. The bullet went through the headrest and hit her in the head. Now, police say that same woman had called them a few minutes earlier to say that someone was either chasing or following her. Police did not find the passenger who was with the woman. They are still looking uh, for whoever shot her. They believe that was someone else, possibly in another car. The Uvalde School Board meeting for the first time since it became public that the district hired a DPS officer under investigation for her role in the Robb Elementary tragedy. And since then, the entire district police department has been suspended. That officer fired and the superintendent has announced his retirement. Dr. Harrell's announcement Friday by email to the district staff has caused division in this community, many voicing their support for the superintendent and the work he's done as an educator for 31 years. This weekend, we spoke with several parents of the Robb Elementary victims who say their intention was never for Harold to retire. It's something they didn't ask for. Today, dozens of organizations from across the country came together at San Antonio College to spread awareness about the importance of this holiday. 
People got to learn about indigenous traditions like song and dance. Tomorrow was the deadline, the last day to register to vote in the November midterm elections. Early voting starts October 24th and the last day to apply for a ballot by mail is October 28th. I get this price tag, $24.2 million, the starting price of the latest concept from submarine builder U-Boat Works. A transforming submersible yacht, the Nautilus gives the wildly wealthy the best of both worlds or just something else to brag about. This luxury super yacht can also dive to depths of 650 feet and stay underwater for days at a time. An added bonus if the sea gets too rough, According to U-Boat's founder, you simply dive and continue your journey comfortably, so no seasickness here. Hmm. I should be comfortable for $24 million. Notice they haven't built it yet. Yeah. It's yeah. just something that looks like it'd Darn be fun it. in the bath. I'm just going to put that in my cart. <laughs> okay, well, we'll be warm over the next couple of days. Low humidity, though, Thursday, even though it'll be in the 90s, it'll be uh, pleasantly low uh, with humidity and windy, though. And then by early next week, we're continuing to hope for some rain. You know we'll keep you posted on air, online, in the KSAT Weather Authority app. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for watching the News at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.